Good morning, everybody. Welcome to worship on our Quilt Sunday. Um, it is, seems very appropriate that the coldest day of the year so far, as fall has now come upon us, we have quilts on all of our chairs. So we're going to talk about that in just a couple minutes. A um, couple announcements first off. Uh, this Saturday is our men's breakfast at 8 o'clock over in the fellowship hall. So we invite all the men to that. Then next Sunday is when we have George from Bethlehem coming here selling those Christmas items um, for that, that they, they fund his mission, but also they fund the, the Holy Land Christian Solidarity Cooperative. Um, other Christians there in the Holy Land and in that Bethlehem area. He comes over here once a year, um, so some of you might recognize him from the past. He will be set up over in the narthex, so either before or after worship at 11 o'clock, head over there to the narthex. Check out some of the stuff that they have over there. And then George will give us a little bit more information with the Temple Talk next Sunday. Then also looking forward to October 25th. Um, October 25th is a Wednesday. We'll be starting a new Wednesday night Bible study led by Pastor Jonathan and Reverend Dr. John Diefenthaler, who was a professor at Concordia Seminary St. Louis and also a president of the Southeastern District. So a really smart, really important guy who's coming here to talk to us a little bit over Zoom, right? He's not going to be here in person. Uh, over Zoom, one of the ways that God used the evil of COVID for the good of his church um, is now we can use Zoom for stuff like this, and he's going to come to us, talk a little bit about Christ and culture. Where, what is Christ doing in our culture and world today? But now we'd like to invite up Miss Roberta to talk a little bit about our quilts and these beautiful items here with us today. Good morning. I'm Roberta Danilovich, and I'm here on behalf of the peacemakers at a Resurrection Lutheran Church. We make hand-tied quilts for two organizations, Sleep in Heavenly Peace, which is a local mission uh, that gives beds and blankets to children in need, and to Lutheran World Relief, which in 2000, 2022 sent over 220,000 quilts to 19 countries across the world. Our group made 30 quilts for Sleep in Heavenly Peace and 234 quilts for Lutheran World Relief. So we have been busy. I want to give a big thank you to all the 20 plus ladies who have put together all of these quilts and a big thank you to everybody who donated fabric or sheets. Please keep them coming. We will make quilts out of them. We have an auction and a sale in 151 after church. Um, we use the funds for two things. We purchase the batting, which is the inside of the quilts. And uh, we also send money to Lutheran World Relief to help defray the cost of sending the quilts overseas. So please come and join us after church. And right now we have a short video. Stunting is a condition caused by chronic malnutrition in early years of child's development. And uh, it's quite actually prevalent in Tanzania. Stunted children are most likely to get sick. They take longer to recover because they have compromised immune system. They have developmental delays and um, they have difficulty learning. When we, I hear that the, such a big number of children are stunted, understanding the effects of the long-term effects of stunting it's really painful because it is also related to in a bit of different of children to develop to their potential mentally one important uh, uh, study was done by ifakara health institute in 2020 and they looked into drivers of stunting in jomba region uh, beyond uh, nutritional intake jomba is one of the coldest areas in tanzania it's mountainous region and during the home visits they observed that children often sit on a cold floor and with very little or no clothes on and uh, concluded that um, 
children instead of using the food intake energy to grow they're using that energy to keep their body warm so that was contributing to stunting when we heard about the study we immediately thought about lutein world release growth program and we thought how this could help us keep those kids warm in Jombe. The quilts came to the very appropriate time because it's a cold condition. They have really touched the, the, the life at in the very appropriate time. We were able to mobilize support and bring quilts to Tanzania and we're expecting one more shipment and we hope to reach close to 9,000 children with this assistance. Thanks so much for whoever both of these children and send the gift. Thank you to quilters on the other side of the globe for all the great work and dedication and for bringing words of their hearts to children of Tanzania. It's very important. Thank you so much. Asante sana. as they make these quilts. So we want to take a moment to uh, say a prayer of blessing over these quilts before they're sent literally all around the world. Um, so if you guys wouldn't mind, go ahead and set a hand over the quilts. Um, if you want to, I guess you could snuggle up with it um, as it's a little bit cooler this morning. But place your hand on one of the quilts as we say a prayer of blessing. God, you give us grace so that we might live and shine your light in this world. You give us grace even though we do not deserve it. You give us grace to share with those that you give us, and you equip us to be your hands and feet in your world. Gracious God, we ask that you may bless these quilts and school kits of earthly meaning, that they may shine your light into someone's darkness. May they bring your comfort to those with pain and those living in chaos. May they bring your love and compassion into the lives of others. In the name of your risen Son, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Roberta. We really encourage all you guys to check out uh, Room 151 and all the items that they have in there. Some absolutely beautiful pieces of work that they have in Room 151. So I hope you guys have a chance to go in there and check it out. As we begin our worship, I invite you all to stand as we begin, as we always do, greeting one another with the peace of God. The peace of the Lord be with you. Greet those around you this morning with that peace. God's peace.
We make our beginning in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared confident of his grace and mercy. Let us then confess our sins to our Heavenly Father. Merciful Father, we confess that we have erred and wandered from your ways like stray sheep. We have followed the desires of our own hearts. We have left undone those things we ought to have done. We have done those things we ought not to have done. We cannot help ourselves. O Lord, have mercy on us. Breathe new life upon us. Teach, reprove, correct, and restore us through your word that we may live in praise of your holy name. In the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the word made flesh. All your sins were atoned for and your sinfulness forgiven. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks be to God. Please be seated.
Our Old Testament lesson this morning is from the book of Isaiah in the fifth chapter, starting at the first verse. If you're following along in your church Bible, you'll find this on page 676. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do with my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. For righteousness, but behold, an outcry. This is the word of the Lord. Let's read responsively Psalm 80, verses 7 through 19. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. You brought the vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out its branches to the sea and its shoots to the river. Why then have you broken down its walls so that all who pass along the way pluck its fruit? The boar and the forest ravages it, and all that move in the field feed on it. Turn again, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and see. Have regard for this vine. They have burned it with fire. They have cut it down. May they perish at the rebuke of your face. But let your hand be on the man of your right hand, the son of man whom you have made strong for yourself. Then we shall not turn back from you. Give us life, and we will call upon your name. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. Glory, Glory be, be to, to the, the Father. Father and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our epistle lesson this morning is from the book of Philippians, chapter 3, starting at verse 4b. If you're following along in your church Bible, this is on page 1166. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the, pray, for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. 
Good morning, everybody. I'd like you to stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 21st chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, hear another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first. And they did the same thing to them. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their season. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruit. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds, because they held him to be a prophet. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Okay, everybody, you can have a seat and invite the younger guys here to come up front. Guys and gals, come up front and just make a circle. I'll be right with you. All right. Good morning, everybody. How are you guys doing today? Good to see you all. All right, so I have a story to talk about. Um, I remember when I was little, there were times that our church would have dinners, and my mom liked to make pies and cupcakes and stuff like that. Anybody here like pies and cupcakes? Or Good, all right. So she would make it, and she would take it to church, and before any of us kids could get to that table, you know, where all the stuff was, it would be all gone. And it was really hard to sit at home and watch her making all that really yummy, delicious stuff and then not get any. Well, later on, as a dad, I remember there were events at our church from time to time where we were asked to bring a toy for a child in the area that didn't have toys for Christmas, right? And so we would go to the store, and uh, I remember asking our kids, you know, what would you guys like? Because I didn't really know, you know, what does a first grader want? You know, I'm a 30-year-old guy, right? And they would say, oh, this would be really cool, or that would be really cool. So we'd buy it, but then some other kid would get it. They wouldn't get it. And that was kind of disappointing. They didn't complain too much, but that was a little bit hard too. So sometimes we're called to share or to do something for somebody else, but it's a little hard because it feels like that thing we're being asked to share is ours. This is probably something you don't know what that is, but I'm holding this up today because in our service in just a few minutes, there's going to be a plate that's going to come around. And all the grown-ups and even the little kids, too, if you want to, are invited to put their offering into the plate. Now, a lot of you parents out there I know do electronic offerings. Your moms and dad, maybe they give money, but it's done sort of behind the scene. You don't see it. And you don't realize that they're giving, but they're actually giving money to he- us here at the church so that we can you know, turn on the lights, turn on the heat in the winter, but more importantly, help other people. Give to people that have needs in our community make these beautiful quilts that get sent around the world. That happens partly through donations, too, and many, many other things that we do here today. The reason we do it is not because it's our stuff to give to somebody else, it's because God has given us so much. God has given you and me, all of us, so much that we don't deserve. Most importantly, he's given us his own son, Jesus, and the gift of eternal life with Christ. So that is all something to say thank you for today. I invite you to fold your hands as we do that right now. Dear God, thank you 
for all the things you give to me each and every day. My health, my home, my family, my friends. The list is too long. But most importantly, we give you thanks for Jesus and the life of love that is ours because of your Son. Lead us to give thanks to you and to share where you lead us to do. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you can go back to your seat. We will continue with the song of the day.
grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, so I have a a brief little joke. It's not a very good joke, but a joke to get things started on, because we're talking about God and money, and that can be a little, you know, make people feel a little bit out of sorts. So it goes like this. There was a guy that had a one-on-one conversation with God to talk about anything he wanted to talk about, and he just wanted to get an idea of this whole notion of eternity. So he said, uh, God, what's a billion years like? And God said, a billion years is like one second. So he said, okay, God, that's amazing. Eternity is just so big, it just makes my mind explode. What about a billion dollars? And God says, a billion dollars is like a penny. So this guy's pretty smart, and he says, God, could I have a penny? And God says, just give me a second. So, okay, so I got you listening, now we're talking about God and money, okay, everybody? Um, no, seriously, there's actually a lot in the Bible about possessions, how we are to live with our possessions, um, with the gifts that God gives to us, and Jesus has a lot to say about it in the Gospels, too. That's why this week, the week after this week, and next week, Pastor Alan, Pastor Zach, and I are going to spend uh, three weeks to focus on that topic, what Thanksgiving looks like, as we talk about God and money, where true riches are to be found. And today, in our gospel reading, the, the outline slides didn't make it into the presentation, but there's only two parts of this you've got to keep straight. One is, we have a story Jesus tells that's all about a rejected son. We have an illustration Jesus gives for a rejected stone that's now become the cornerstone. You got it? Rejected son the story, image of a rejected stone, which has now become the cornerstone, and that is what's going to show us where true riches are to be found. So in getting after that parable Jesus tells about the wicked tenants, is what it's often called, let's uh, once again sort of reinvigorate that story with a telling in our own time using images we understand And the way I like to do that today is to tell you a story about an imaginary guy named Bob Jones. Sorry, Bob Smith. I think I got his name. (laughs) Bob Smith. So Bob Smith was a mayor of a small town on on the North Carolina shore, one of the Outer Banks. And he spent time and money and lots and lots of love building a beautiful home that's right down by the water. And it's been something that he sort of added on to over the years. He's kept it up, taken care of it. Uh, Most recently, he's replaced the windows. He's got a new deck that looks out over the ocean. It's just an amazing place. But family business takes Bob away from that area. And so he has to find a way to uh, still care for it. So he invites two friends of his, John and Jennifer Jones, to come in and just be there so that they can kind of look after things and all of that. He's not trying to make any money, just wants to have a little bit of income from the Joneses so that he can make sure the utilities keep running, all of that. So he gets them set up with a realty company and all seems to be well, only the payments, the monthly payments for the rent never show up. What's more, they are, the realty company starts sending people to their house because they don't pick up the phone and they don't answer the phone or open the door. What they don't realize is that John and Jennifer Jones really love this place and they love it so much that they're using their money and a lot of their funds to kind of redo it, to make it their own space and to buy lots of gadgets that just make life kind of fun for them. When the realtor representatives show up, police report will later show that many of them were assaulted and sent on their way. Bob gets word of it and he says, what is going on with John and Jennifer? These are my friends. I can't believe what's going on here. But I know what I'll do. They know my son Steve. They know and love my son Steve. I'll send Steve to them and he'll make things right. He'll explain things. So Steve goes off. He's gone for a little bit of a while. It takes a while to get there. And the word comes back to Bob later on, you get a phone call from the hospital, that there's been some sort of altercation on the front porch of the house, and it seems that Steve has been shot. He's actually uh, laying there, somebody calls 911, a neighbor, 
They take him to the hospital, but he dies on the way to the hospital. So God just simply, or, or Bob rather, just simply says, I don't know how things could have gotten to this place. He grieves for his son, but he realizes now that the justice system must just run its course. I don't have to tell you as I tell the story who the different players are, right? God is the owner of the vineyard. That's an old theme that runs throughout the Old Testament. You saw it in the psalm reading today. God is the one who plants the vineyard, and the vineyard is Israel. And the tenant of the vineyard, or you might say John and Jennifer Jones, represent anybody who lives in the place of God's creation and at the end of the day basically says, this stuff is mine. I believe in me. The Son of course, is the son of the almighty God, Jesus Christ. And the story Jesus tells is actually a foreshadowing within this gospel of what would happen to him. Now we back up and take a listen to this and we go, man, those, <clears throat> those Pharisees and chief priests really got it wrong. I mean, Jesus was speaking to them, he was doing miracles, and they didn't recognize who he was. How could that happen? and we kind of put some distance between ourselves and the Pharisees. But if you just bear with me here a moment, this text is in our Bible, in our Gospel, was recorded by one of the evangelists for our benefit today. There's a little bit of Pharisee inside each and every one of us. And because that Pharisee is inside each and every one of us, this story Jesus tells is necessary to call us to repent to see with our very own eyes our tendency to live according to our own, what we feel we need, and not, or what we feel we want, and not necessarily what God knows we need. Now, I'd like to back up with you a minute and have you think about examples in the Gospels of Pharisees who just didn't get it when it came to living out an attitude of thanksgiving. More than once, Jesus uses this illustration of the Pharisees falling short in the context of money and possessions. When he tells his Sermon on the Mount, the Pharisees are indicated there in the way that they pray, among other things. The way that they give alms. And Jesus says when they go into the temple and they give an offering, they broadcast it to everyone. What does Thanksgiving look like? Thanksgiving doesn't look like leaning into our own lives of service or our own life of offerings or do-gooding just to make an impression on everybody else. Elsewhere, Jesus talks about a Pharisee and a tax collector in the temple at the same time. What's the Pharisee giving thanks for? In his prayer, he says, Lord, I give you thanks. I'm not like that sinner over there. So what does Thanksgiving look like? Thanksgiving doesn't look like living out your acts of service. In this case, the Pharisee even mentions that I give a tithe. That guy, I don't know what he gives over there, but I'm giving a tithe. Once again, it doesn't come from an attitude of looking down and judging and putting everybody else in where I think their place is. Rather, it's the man who stands there before a holy God and says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. If you really want to know what Thanksgiving looks like, read the epistle lesson we just heard from Philippians chapter 3. In there, St. Paul talks about how he had every reason to be boastful and to lord it over everybody else because of his education and his high standing once upon a time and all these things. Now he's writing his letter in prison as a follower of Jesus. And he says, you know, that life of good reputation and high standing and doing good works to get noticed, all of that is nothing more than crap, is actually what the Greek word is. Nothing more than crap because of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. That's where value was to be found. 
in Jesus Christ as Lord. So St. Paul kind of paints that picture, gets us thinking along the lines of how uh, God wants to guide and lead us today. Well, going back to the gospel, Jesus didn't end things, did he, with that parable of the unfaithful tenants in the vineyard. He tells the story, and then he keeps on talking, and then he uses an image of something else that's rejected. Not a rejected son, but in this case, a rejected stone. And he says, quoting a Bible verse that would have been well known to the Pharisees in the audience at the time, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone or the cornerstone, there's different ways to translate it, has become the cornerstone. This is, this is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. There is indeed a story to be told, a story that calls us up short, brings us to a place of repentance, shows us our sins where we see that, yes, too often we want to live as if I believe in me, is what we're confessing. The good news is that the rejected son of God, Jesus Christ, the one who would be put to death on the cross for you and me, rejected by his compatriots, rejected because of the sins that you and I uh, engage in, our own brokenness, rejected by us, rejected even by his father, his holy father, who could only turn his back on Jesus because he carried our guilt, our sins upon himself in that moment on the cross, and suffered the punishment for sins that we deserve. All of it happened. All of it. So that that rejected stone might become the cornerstone. So that that rejected Son of God might on Easter Sunday come back to life, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, that he might be for us life itself, and that Jesus Christ as one who was living is now not only living and with you and me, he's ascended to the throne of heaven. He's on the right hand of the Father. He has received all authority in heaven and on earth. And together with God, our Heavenly Father, who gives us all that we need, he's there for us, forgiving our sins and granting us a new beginning each and every day. And when our heart is tempted to stray, put our trust in other things, Jesus is there to point the way home time and time again. There's an a article I'm going to summarize briefly that I saw just recently about two guys uh, that were both wealthier than most of us here can even dream of being, and that's okay. But they were, one guy was a chemical engineer working for a petrochemical company that was going to send him overseas, give him a whopping salary. Another guy was a wealth manager and doing quite well at that. And they both decided that they wanted to get a little bit more education, so they were going to go to Harvard Business School and get a degree. But while they were in that program, part of what they were asked to do was to take an elective. So they both took an elective at Harvard Divinity School. And it was when they were at Harvard Divinity School that these two guys, both of them Christian, both of them well-versed in the notion that you know, offerings and sacrifice and giving and service is a part of the Christian life. They kind of compared notes. They said before they took this class, before they really studied what the Word of God had to say, they kind of imagined that an offering was sort of like, you know, your church's membership fee. You pay it and then you kind of move on. (laughs) After the class and studying what God's Word has to say about all these matters, and doing a survey and connecting with people who were themselves living a life of gratitude and peace and contentment, they said, you know what? Something's not right here. And one of them said at the end of it, he said, my thinking, which up to that time had been, how much of my stuff will I give, flipped upside down and came and said, how much of God gifts to me will I keep? And he said, that made all the difference. We are going to blow it every time, guys, when it comes to knowing what good stewardship looks like. But the good news is today for us, as Peter wrote in his first letter, the good news is that you and I have been built as living stones around the chief cornerstone, Jesus Christ, the stone that was rejected, yes, 
but the stone around which we are built as the household of God, aligned with him, with hearts that are receiving Jesus himself today as we do in his sacrament, so that we might have in a much smaller and, of course, imperfect way from where we see an attitude of sacrifice, that we might love one another, love the people in need of this world, and see what God has blessed us with as potential for those who don't have what we have. We're still going to, from time to time, live as if we truly are saying, I believe in me. We're still going to, from time to time, have an inadequate faith that doesn't put its trust in God and the gift of life in Christ Jesus alone. But the good news is that we have been rescued. Jesus is our Savior. He is there for you and me again today. And he brings us again today in the word and sacraments that you see here, the gift of true riches, forgiveness, life, a new beginning. As you seek God's path for you, as you are led by him to live out thanks living, as some call it, that life of thanks living, the peace which passes all human understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now I invite you to stand as we confess our faith in our God. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sin, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us now go before our God in prayer, recognizing our need for his presence and his work in our lives, and also our place as servants before him and as he uses us in this world. So let's go before our God in prayer. Father God, creator of all things, we give you thanks for giving us those gifts that only you can give and for giving us all that is within our possession, our physical items, those that we have around us that we love and hold dear in our relationships, and those gifts that only you can give of your grace, love, and forgiveness in our lives. May all these gifts that you have given us, may we use them well, guide our lives that we may orient our priorities and desires towards you and your desire that all people may come to the knowledge of the truth, that all people may know your love for them. Lord, as we use our gifts and possessions, may we use them to glorify your name, recognizing that they belong to you, that they are not our own, but they are gifts meant to be used for your kingdom purposes. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, Savior of the world, we give you great thanks and praise that you have called us your own, that through your death and resurrection, you have put to death our sin, that we may be yours for all eternity. May we continually press on towards that goal of eternal life that you have accomplished for us. In your greatness, Lord, may we become less in humility to learn your way and to be used by you to point others to your love for them. Lord, in your mercy. 
And Lord, as we recognize our place before you, we recognize your great love and power for all people. We ask that you may be with those who call upon you for healing in their time of need. Be with Eric, Mara, Connie, Marty, Elvin, Karen, and Dave. May your will be done in their lives, Lord. May they know your love, your grace, your truth for them. We give you great thanks and play, praise for a past test recently, Lord, as we know and recognize that you are at work there. And Lord, as we look out throughout this world, we see pain, war, hate, division. We ask that you may be with all those in Israel upon the recent attacks. Be with all those in Afghanistan after the recent earthquakes there. Be with all those in Ukraine in the war there as well. And so many throughout this world who face such pain due to the hate and sin in this world. May you bring peace here. May your peace come quickly. May your work and your word be made known. And even in the midst of war and tragedy and hate, may you equip your church to bring your love and gospel where it is so desperately needed. Lord, in your mercy. And dear Holy Spirit, we give you thanks for coming into our lives as the presence of God among us. You are the helper that the Son has sent to be with us. May you help us, equip us, cause us to grow as we travel through the Scriptures to orient ourselves around the desires of the Father, live in the mission of the Son, as you equip us with the gifts that you work within us. May you grant us an attitude of gratitude, that we may live lives of thankfulness, always giving credit towards you and your work within us. Use this gift now of the true body and blood of the Son and our Savior, that in this gift you may work that forgiveness, that grace that leads to life everlasting, forever uniting us with the church and the body of Christ throughout the world and into eternity. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we ask that you hear our prayers and that you answer our prayers. Equip us with your Spirit to give us patience as we wait. Equip us with your Son and his forgiveness as you guide us to live in your mission. All this we pray in the name of your Son, our Lord. Amen. And Jesus, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever.
great but chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. The darkness, your loving kindness, tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my
bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ trumpet sound Oh may I then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone faultless stand before the throne The worship is ended the service now begins. Go in peace to serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.